Hello there, everybody. Dennis Prager and Julie Hartman. Dennis and Julie. As I said that, I thought, why did I say Dennis first? Is that is that bad? Is it arrogant? No, you're. But because it's Dennis and Julie. Of course, and also you're in, you're speaking first. If a guy said to you, "You're in an elevator. The only other person is a guy," and he goes, "Ladies first. What? How would you react? I would love it. You know, when I was in London, I uh, was walking with a British guy. We met at the the subway or the tube station, and we were walking uh, down the street, and um, he changed sides with me to walk on the side of the the road so that I was more right. sheltered. Yeah. And I, w- I stopped and I went, oh my gosh, that's so nice. I had no one, no, I had never seen a guy do that. And he said, and I, and I said that I said, I, I've never had a guy do that. And he wait, goes, really? wait, you were not talking. You did not know each other. No. This was a random man. No, no, no. We we met. We met at the subway station. We were going to the same arc event. And so we met at the oh, same oh, subway you, okay. station. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, uh, no, no. Either station. way, it's, it, it's fine. Uh, yes, but I was we were curious. walking. Yeah, and okay, he just I went it. onto the... And I was like... Yeah. So it, it, what percentage of women your age would have your positive reaction? Hmm. You know, I actually... I actually think more than you would expect. Right. It doesn't fully answer my question. I'm not being cute. No, I understand. What, what it doesn't. Per, what percentage? I mean, there's no way to know. Do you think 50%? What do you think? I don't know. That's why I asked it. I well, have no idea. People my age. Yeah. Probably 50. It should be 100. Of course. Well, and, and my question for people who wouldn't like that is, well, what's so, what's so bad about it? You know, the, the feminists did, did say Did I that, ever tell the story? Because that did happen to somebody who wrote to me. It drives me crazy that I don't remember the details, but it was something to the effect that at some restaurant where the waiter said I'll, I'll, something to the effect, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get the orders from the ladies first, one of the women was offended. <laughs> so weird. So weird. Why, why would you get offended by that? You know, sorry, no, were you going to no, say something? No, no, you, you could tell I was going to say, no, no, go ahead, doesn't matter. I've observed this on Dennis and Julie before, but, you know, when you look at someone, there are indicators that, that you can kind of pull out of their wealth or their pr- privileged status socioeconomically. You can see what kind of clothes they're wearing, you can see jewelry, you can see a watch, you can tell by the way that they speak that they may have had, you know, a, a good education. We, we know that. But I actually think that your worldviews can be just as indicative of your privileged status as the clothes you wear or the way that you speak. And if you are offended by a waiter the odds saying are you're, ladies you're, first. You're in the wealthier well, top third. Well, the odds are that you have had a pretty cushy yeah. life if you think that that is something that ought to earn Trouble your you. ire. I mean. Earn your ire. You're in good form today. R- really? Yeah. But no, no, that was very well stated, I got to say. And I don't know. I often think that, but I don't know. Well, I love finding it. eloquent ways to say common things. Like, why? See, in my head, I was going, say something, phrase it in a different you know way than rem- offend you, know, you. Well, you know what this reminds me of? I was reading a, a, an article that your generation, generally speaking, what is your generation? Z? I'm Gen Z, yeah. yeah. So Gen Z, all they care about in texting is that they're understood. Mm. They're not interested in spelling correctly. They're not interested even in spelling out a word. They're not interested in punctuation. They're not interested in capital letters. Is I believe that to be true. Oh, yeah. You're right? So this is very worthy of note. I go, I review every text I send. I know, yours are flawless. They're, and they're meant to be. And it's not, I, I know that I'm not showing off. I don't think the reader is thinking, wow, that's really impressive. This mm-hmm. guy really obviously cared to write a proper text. I do it for me. Mm. 
I want to be proud of everything I do, even text messaging. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. I thought it would. Well, it's interesting that you're bringing this up as we're, we have started a little bit to talk about male, female relationships, dating, because when I go on dating apps, by the way, (laughs) did you see what I sent you the other night? I, maybe not. I sent I sent Dennis a screenshot of the first person that came up for me on Hinge, and I feel like it may be bad to put this up because we didn't get permission from this person. But the but the guy was so well. It, you, it was you sent so that delinquent. Like, didn't, you send, didn't you send that in the past as well? Oh, I've, I I often yeah, do that. that. But I've last seen, night yeah. I said okay. I sent what, what, what did he look like? What 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 was? I really the, want to pull up a photo. So can we block out an eye? What do you think, Sean? Yeah, block- I don't know. I don't want to. I don't. No, wanna- no, no, I, no, no. You're making a point. The point is not to make fun of the guy. The the point is to make a point. What do we think, Sean? Well, wait. If we, if the no, everyone's e- saying wait. No. Even if the guy is not uh, identifiable, but he might be by. All right, describe it. Okay. The guy was like this, like. Sitting back like that. It was. He, was he yeah. seated? Yeah. Like like. And then there were, he had like. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, I don't, he's, he's right. There are people who listen and don't watch. I, don't, I can't oh, describe your look, though. Just delinquent hours. Just so like. I want to I ask that person, what about this photo do you think is going to impress a woman? Right. You're not right. sitting up straight. You look like you're trying to like. You're coming off as like uh, you're a pimp. You're trying to look oh, cool. Uh-huh. He's this cool, weird, right. That's like, what I got out subversive of it. Cool. facial expression. Maybe, it's just like, so, come on, uh, dude. Right. So he probably thinks that women are attracted to quote unquote bad guys. Right. So anyway, that was just a total tangent apropos right. of Dennis and Julie. But um, my wait, 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 wait. Sean is the, is the, what? is disturbing the uh, broadcast. What did he say? Can I look for just a second? Look like a pimp. This is what I have to do. He deal does with. every day. He does now. Who? Look at him now, Sean. Sean. No, he no, looks no. Like a he pimp wants right me now. to try. Oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay. Every day, continue. Sean looks like a pimp. Oh, I'd love to see Prager pimp. Prager pimp costume. I have no idea. How, how does a pimp look? How the hell do I? How come I get? Okay. You don't know what a pimp looks like. Come no. on, you've okay. seen movies. Uh, yes, you can. You know. Right. Okay. You see him on the street corners in LA. I did watch Ben's LA. rap video. It it went viral. Oh, that was funny. Yeah, well, he did it well. He was so funny. Yeah. Yeah, and Nicki Minaj praised him. Anyway, the reason that the the picture was a total aside, though, I have to say it would be a really funny segment if I could do this legally. Um. If I could go on Timeless and just go through the Hinge oh, profile, I think people would wow. be fascinated and point oh, is out that true, right? And point out. And, and by the way, I sometimes I fear I, I'm coming off as overly critical. Any girl who has my worldview and looks at these Hinge accounts would think the same thing. This is not. I'm not nitpicking here. These are just general poses, ways of dressing, ways of answering prompts, which are just so. Again, the word I come up with is delinquent It's just like, ugh. Anyway, so on Hinge, you were talking about texting. One of the ways that I kind of immediately disqualify a guy, and I, I know I sound really critical, but it, I'm just being honest, is if they write like, hey, how are you? That's you right. Know? Yes, and by I, the agree, way, I agree with you. I am not, unlike Dennis Prager, when I'm texting with my friends, I use slang. I, I, it's sort of a mix for me. Like I'll say, you know, love and then the letter U, you know, if I'm writing to my friend. So I'm not, I'm not like. Right. But to anyone who isn't intimate with you and, and and doesn't matter, so to speak. I I understand that. Well, I think it's about first impressions. Uh, That's right. That's what it's about. Why doesn't the guy. Care about impressing, Why isn't there a voice in him that thinks, well, she'll think I'm, well, I'll tell you why. I was just going to use a word that they would never use. I was going to use the word sophisticated. Mm. But it's not a word anyone in your generation would use. Right. I, I, I don't want to appear sophisticated. In fact, they would probably have contempt for that. 
that's like old white men want to be sophisticated. That is very true. I often find sometimes when I'm talking with people my age about some of my interests or some of my hobbies, like they kind of look at me like I'm a little weird. It's not, and I get the vibe that it's, as you say, it's not cool to, to be sophisticated. I don't know if it's, that doesn't mean that it's cool to be dumb. I'm sure among some people it's cool to be dumb. But I was recently reading a, a picture book on Giotto, the painter, and looking at some of his paintings, which, by the way, I'm going to do a show on. This 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 painter is so cool, and he revolutionized the, the art of painting. Um, and I was talking about it with some people my age, and they were just kind of like laughing at me. See, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. it should be like all of us should endeavor to be deeper, deeper well, and more sophisticated. To, why why is it? Uh, I know we, we've talked. We, we can't no, talk no, no, about that, this that, again. But. Yeah, we well, don't have to. But I want to go back to just the point that I made. I from when I was young, much younger than you in, mm-hmm. in high school, I wanted to be proud of anything associated with me. Mm-hmm. Isn't that a good thing to aspire to yes absolutely so i i when i send a text uh, i understand forgetting intimates but to, to to most people my my sense is i i want in the best sense of the word for them to have respect for me uh, to See, this is the irony. I'm going to say a word which sounds bad about me, but I want I want to impress them. But why I, is that bad? Because it sounds self-aggrandizing, it sounds egocentric, but it's not about my ego and it's not it's about I want them to see me in in in, in an admirable light. Why doesn't everybody have that instinctively? But but it's been shattered. It, the The very notion is probably dismissed as as old people. Why do you think, or how do you think? Because there's been a war on truth, beauty, and goodness. They're corny. They're old fashioned. They're not hip. They're not cool. Whatever term you want to use. That's what we began with. Why did this guy look like a jerk? He wanted to look cool. It's not cool to send a text with everything spelled correctly. I just mm-hmm. I, I just showed you an ad that I was given to read prior, right prior to our going yes. on. <laughs> and it, it had... Um, there. Yeah, so it had... Uh, they're offering this product at, at a you know a great at a great price, T H E I R. They're offering the product. Yes. yes, that's how it was spelled. I I wonder what percentage of college sophomores would detect the the error. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. He he asked me if somebody sends me a text and it's grammatically uh, error filled. And what was the other term he used? No. Well, shorthand. No. The the shorthand. If it it, 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 let me put it to you this way. Half of my texting is to people deeply embedded in my life. If they go, are you free, capital R, capital U, free, it, it, it has no impact right. on me. None. It's about I first make impressions. That That's right. But the other half of my texting is like, say, somebody from some city uh, saying, so, you know, you're coming, uh, you're coming to Cleveland to speak next month. Can, can, we, can we speak? I would hope that they would send me a properly spelled text of course yes and that's you know on hinge or on other dating sites when the guy is first messaging me i want him to pay attention to grammar and punctuation because it's like i respect you i'm trying to impress you and i'm trying to show that i'm sophisticated good way in trying to impress people absolutely and a guy should a guy should aspire to impress a woman he's trying to woo 
That's it's all backwards to me. It is all backwards. I mean, and, and, and then once, you know, I'm dating someone or it, again with my friends, I'm not I don't write these perfectly uh, grammatical, you know, texts. I, I use shorthand with my friends, but that's because they're my friends. They're not they're not someone who I'm meeting for the first time trying to. It's like, would you let's say that you I mean, I'll, I'll use an example with with you when when. I first came here and did your radio show, like day one when you invited me on. You were gracious enough afterwards to say, if you'd ever like to come to my house and watch a taping of the Fireside Chat, you're more than welcome. And I remember you said, I'll text you my address and the time, what's your cell phone number? So you sent me the address. And so imagine if I had written back like THX, thanks. I, I, Why, would not I would have, never it, it, do that. Right, that's I, right. I may write back THX that's, to my friend who says, right. you know, Correct. like, see you, at, I made that's a reservation right. at, you yeah. know, this place because they're my friend. If When I'm trying to, when I'm building a relationship with someone or a potential, you know, future boss or something, you, no one would think twice that, of course, you would write out the, the long thank you. You know, you would, you would make an effort to show that you're impressive. So why doesn't the same apply to, to dating? But it's it's totally to your point that being sophisticated and being or precise another word, or, or another word or traditional that, that, or classy traditional, w- which is certainly not a word your generation would use because it's a negative. Classy that implies classes. Dennis Prager here with a man I have come to admire for his work. So when I asked him, "What do you do?" This is the title he gave, Wealth Architect. Very simply put, I am a wealth architect that helps my clients accelerate the way they grow your wealth. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Internal Revenue Code is embedded with a number of things that you can take advantage of. It's what I call playing tax chess. We take the time to play tax chess in your favor. We give our clients unbiased, independent advice across all areas in their financial life because we have no incentive to sell anything. I was taken enough and impressed enough to have you do my work. And you have, in fact, saved me a serious amount of money. CharlesDombeck.com slash Prager. Mm. See, I don't, you know, well... I don't know if it's so much that it implies. Cl- I'm sure among the woke, that's that's why that's they wouldn't use that. Of, but yeah, but a lot of your but I think my is generation. Woke. Yeah, but I think even non woke people in my generation, it's not a word that we would use because, to your well, point, well, you wouldn't it's, use sophisticated. It's, either. No, it's seen as as antiquated. I'm try. It's a really important point. And I'm trying to figure out why this is or where it comes from. Well, they would but, think. Well, they would think. I'll give you a whole list of things that that they think are words that are antiquated, that are good, mature. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I rarely hear that. Word oh, used. oh, uh, the I can't believe the word doesn't have negative connotations. If somebody would say, you know, that's not mature, they'd go, "Oh, give me a break! What you, what era are you from?" You know, maybe what it is is that everyone wants to come off as casual or as, as cool nothing, and they're not thinking matters. about things. Global warming matters, but no, but nothing about my life. No, there, there's no goal hmm. of excellence that I should pursue. It, it, it's... By the way, I just want to make something clear. There's a, a voice in me that thinks... Has every generation in history lamented the next generation? Am I just falling <laughs> into the the trap that others have? But I, I'm not kids like these that. Kids these days. Hmm? Uh, yeah, kids, kids these, these days. days. Yes, exactly. But th- that's... I was unhappy about my own generation. Well, let me ask you a tough question. Is there anything about Gen Z that you admire? Or is there anything about my generation that you think we're doing better than generations before? I, I can't think of anything, but again, your generation is not defined yet. I mean, I, I got to give That's you time. That's fair. What about yours? What or what about the baby boom? Are, are you a baby boomer? Yeah, I'm a baby boomer. I, I, 
I have always had a low opinion of my generation. There are a lot of, look, there are terrific people in your generation. There are terrific people in millennials. There are are great people in every generation. There were great people in Nazi Germany. There were great people in, in the Soviet Union. There is always a certain number of great human beings. Mm-hmm. That's tr- certainly true for my generation as well. But uh, I, I believe that my generation ushered in the decline of the United States. We are the product of a crappy upbringing. The great generation that fought World War II did not know how to raise children. Why? Oh, I know exactly why. I knew this when I was your age and I was already lecturing. And I would look at an audience of people, all of whom were the World War II generation, and I'd say, you know, your motto is, we want to give everything we didn't have to our children, meaning affluence and peace, generally speaking, but especially material benefits. And I would look at the audience and say, that's really nice. The problem is you didn't give us anything you did have. And I, and, I, and I told them what? Religion, patriotism. They didn't, they didn't hand over what made their generation great. Hmm. And I even know why that, because you know my operative question is always why. Because they were not aware of the fragility yeah. of all the good values. Hmm. Ronald Reagan's great line, and he, 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 had, he was a brilliant man, but... The sophisticates didn't think he was brilliant because he spoke intelligibly. He didn't speak in, in academies. And he's, academies? Yes. Is that a real word? No, but, I, it, but it's you. I love that. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that. I'm going to adopt that or borrow it. So he, he said, we are always one generation from losing freedom. One right. generation away. Oh, gosh. Let me get you something. I have to read this. You'll love this. I just used a Prager line. You'll love this. Um, You realize you say that a lot. Do you love this? Yeah, you'll love this. Okay. It's okay. I I was told that I use the term mealy-mouthed a lot. So we we all have our our things that that we love uh, to to go to. Um, Oh, damn. Where is it? Oh, gosh. Oh, here. So my friend recently went to Nebraska to visit one of his friends, and they went to the Museum of the Air Force there, and he sent me, there's an inscription um, that was dedicated to people who, um, Air Force members who served in Nebraska, or, or who are from Nebraska who served in the Cold War. And here's the inscription we, uh, of this of this uh, statue that he sent to me. He said, this, the inscription says, we must never forget that freedom is never really free. It is the most costly thing in the world. Freedom is never paid in a lump sum. Installments come due in every generation. All any of us can do is is offer that generations that follow have a chance for freedom. But I love that. It's so true. It's it you can't pay in a lump sum. You have to pay in installments and every generation is obligated to pay their installment to ensure their security right. and, and for the next generation. And if you don't pay generation. that installment, you you lose the product. Right. And that's and that's what we're seeing now. Yeah, so I think about this too because I, I'm i very critical of my generation. I'm very critical of the baby boomers. But I also want to be fair and think, is there something that we're doing that actually is good? Is there a quality that we have? A lot of people would say that we're extraordinarily tolerant, but I actually think it's the opposite. People would oh say, my oh, God, we're, that we're so... so oh that, that's God. what people would say about us. And that's what... Right. And uh, I was watching speeches... Um, then Vice President Joe Biden spoke at class day at Harvard uh, during their graduation ceremony in 2017. And he said, you guys are the most tolerant generation to ever exist. The way that you love each other, the way that you accept people who are gay. I I, I will say this. Yeah. This is why I don't blame your generation. Really? Yeah. I, I don't have great admiration yet it i may turn out wrong but <laughs> with all my criticism of my generation 
we had a lot of wonderful people as well. And part of the reason is they didn't tell us all the time how terrific we were. Hmm. Nobody got up that I, I, I would like to see the, the, you, were you the one, was it Nathan Pusey, remember? Were, yeah. Yeah, you, you yeah. cited a, in 1960, yes, uh, I remember. Yes, good it. memory. Yeah, our last, Dennis and Julie, or one of our last ones. And you cited uh, his his talk. He didn't he didn't go, oh, you're you're the great leaders, you're the terrific, you're the tolerant, you're the open, he you're the He was actually this. criticizing yes. the audience. All I remember was, you have to live up to the past. I, in my religious Jewish school, we were taught the opposite. And I think they went overboard, believe it or not. Nevertheless, we were taught, there's a concept in Hebrew, Yeridat Hadorot. The, uh, the, the diminution of the generations, that we are standing on the shoulders of giants before us. Mm-hmm. Not, oh, you're great. No, the greats have already lived. You're on their shoulders. Mm-hmm. We never got that type of talk, thank God. I mean, you got it. I mean, I can't believe what, what you were told at the Harvard graduation. It drives me crazy. That we're yes, you're we're, we're going to change the world. Yeah, yes. yeah. We, we may right. change the world. Right. They're, they're, That's right. They're not wrong about that. I uh, one of the deans said, "I have no doubt that your generation will uh, make you know the a positive impact on this country." Right. I, and I was no thinking, doubt. I have no doubt that our That's generation's right. going to make a negative. That's impact. right. Well, because you're a dean, because you have made a negative impact. By the way, I have a theory as okay. to why people constantly compliment young people. Okay, yeah. I'm curious if you do. Give me a, give me a few minutes, or give me a few seconds. Um, hmm. I may be wrong, but I do have a, th- you a tell strong me your theory. theory. My theory is they want to be liked. Oh, well, that's certainly true. Okay, then that's it. You don't have to go further. Yes. Yeah. It's really about them. See, you, if you get up and you criticize the Harvard class of whatever year, they may not like you for it. And the desire to be liked, which is a catastrophe. It is a catastrophe. The only, this is, I'm adamant about this. The only people you should work to be liked by are your peers your spouse, and your friends. Mm-hmm. That's it. Go, go. You wanted to say something. No, no, I, you finished. Uh, okay. The, if you are in any position of authority, a dean, uh, a teacher, a policeman, a parent, a parent, a parent. Did I say parent? <laughs> if, if you work to be liked, you will do a bad, destructive job. I have been thinking about this so much lately because one of the subjects that you often bring up on this show and on your radio show is, is it a blessing or a curse to have a happy childhood? Right. And we've kind of uncovered that that having a challenging upbringing actually benefits you later most, in life of most course people. most people of course sometimes right. it can be debilitating but but yeah. but sometimes having and, and we're not talking about child abuse of course just, not just of difficult, course not difficult right. yes yeah. and so i have thought about that same question with regard to being well liked because y- you have hit the nail on the head that many deans and not just you know de- you just went through the list of parents and you know all, pe- Teachers, people everywhere right. they they have a desire to Clergy. be to be liked and i am someone who over the past 3 4 years of my life have witnessed a lot of people start to not like me and that i'm i am not complaining i have wonderful friends i have wonderful professional life i have wonderful family i mean i it's not like everybody's turned on me but 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 I have seen it, and and not to, I don't mean this as a bragging way, but there was no one at my high school who had a more sterling reputation than I. I was beloved at my high school, and I was, be- be- I'm sure, I'm sure there were some people who didn't like me, but I, 
I, I had a I really, you. really I, good I reputation. You. Right. And, and I, not just in my high school, but just in every community that I was in, and I knew this, that I had a very, people really admired me, respected me, and liked me. And since I started doing this job, I have seen people come out of the woodwork either through the grapevine or you know to my face to tell me that they are disappointed in me that they think what I'm doing is terrible that you know I, I've had that and there were times when it was really hard certainly the first two weeks I talk about this this time in my life a lot the first two weeks after I went public on your radio show that was really really hard because it was just a bombardment of people but now I am I view it as such a blessing and it's weird because Believe it or not, I don't go out every day endeavoring to not be liked. If I could wave a magic wand, of course I would have everybody like me. Who wouldn't? But it is, it's strangely liberating to have people not like you. Because you're no longer, you're no longer thinking about how to please them because you know they already don't like you. You know that the, the, the effort would be wasteful because the ship has sailed. They're not a fan of you. And so that actually enables you to keep doing what you're doing because you're no longer you know, looking to the side to, to, to appease someone. And so I sort of wish for, I mean, listen, if you, if someone at your funeral gives a speech and says, this person had no enemies. They were liked by everyone. They never disappointed anybody. Then the odds are that that person lived a very safe life, a, you know, a not principled life. When you when you live a principled life, you're going to tick some people off. And That's right. That's right. Do, do you agree? I agree. It's a, who, who wouldn't agree? It, it's... If, you, if one knows anything of history, were were great figures? Oh, of course. They're they're the we've talked about this. Everybody. They're the most persecuted. Yes, they're the most disliked. Well, that, that's the Christian. That's the whole Christian message, right? The the one perfect person was was crucified. Mm-hmm. But I sort of wish that for people. I <laughs> it sounds like a strange wish, but I I wish that more people would become accustomed with people being disappointed in them or disapproving of them because when people disapprove of you you're kind of you're kind of set free right. you should not aim to of course. be disliked of course. and you're not saying that i'm making that clear and we all rather be liked than disliked when i spoke at this convention of this conservative women's group in philadelphia about a year ago moms for liberty so I spoke. At, I was the, the, the keynote speaker for their Sunday event, <laughs> and there was a big demonstration outside, big one of people who, you know, woke folks, especially on behalf of LGBTQIA+. Which, by the way, I'm curious if this is if our stuff is watched 20 years from now, mm-hmm. let alone 50, and mm-hmm. I hope it is. But I, by the way, I hope it is too. Uh, Will they even know what LGBTQIA plus mm-hmm. is? But in any event, so uh, I passed them, and I, oh, as I walked into the hotel, there was a lot of FUs at me. Really? I, yeah, I didn't even know that they knew who I was. Where it was I, like an organized protest? Well, yeah, or? there was an organized protest, basically. Yeah, and uh, they were behind a, a, a little barricade, and I was in the inside going into the hotel. So I actually walked over to them, and with a big smile, I go, you know, I'm very curious to know why you hate me. And first of all, it was obvious they were taken aback that I would even show up and dialogue with them. No animosity. I didn't go F you back to them. I just, I was very curious. What have I said? And by the way, I was very curious. Of course. Why do you hate me? Right. I, I, I don't know what I say that should elicit such hatred. Well, you, you, I remember you're telling me this story, and what you told me is that you said, I've dedicated my whole life to trying to bring yes. people to God, to trying to make marriages better, to try to make oh, people more say God, principled. Just, yeah, goodness. You know, w- w- yes. Why do you hate me? When right. I dedicated my whole life to trying to improve people's lives. What did they say? Folks, are you ready to lose weight but not sure where to start? 
So I'd like to tell you why I chose PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition. First, Dr. Ashley Lucas has her PhD in Chronic Disease and Sports Nutrition. The program is completely science-based. The PhD program starts with nutrition and is a lot more than that. They know that 90% of permanent change comes from the mind, and they work on eliminating the reasons you gained the weight in the first place. There are no shortcuts, no pills, no injections, just solid science-based nutrition and behavior change. It's worked for me. It has worked for my colleagues, Seb Gorka and Mike Gallagher. If you are ready to lose weight... For the last time, call 864-644-1900, 864-644-1900 to get started or online at myphdweightloss.com and do what I and so many others do and so many others did, in fact. And that's just make an appointment for your one-on-one consultation. It's free. Call today, 864-644-1900. Oh, didn't one no, call you a Nazi just or something? Basically, yes. You're, you're, you know, you're speaking at a Nazi conference. Miles it's for you know what? I it mean, is so it, sick, and it, we. It is. And you know what? We. I'm realizing what we as conservatives and as rational thinkers have to do now is that we we are so always on the defensive we need to start playing offense when people levy an accusation at us you know like oh well you're at a nazi conference the 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 modus operandi that we have pursued up until now has been no no i'm not or what makes you say that you know trying to disprove their point what i am now doing and it's a conscious effort is i'm trying to flip it i'm trying to be on the offensive and go how dare you how dare you say that this is a Nazi conference? Do you know that you are cheapening the charge? Do you know what an egregious atrocity Nazism was in Germany? And you are going to stand here and you are going to so recklessly throw out that term and say that this convention of Moms for Liberty is a Nazi conference? Shame on you. I'm done that playing is, defense. No, no that is I'm entirely done. the accurate re- way to respond. Because th- we need to start stigmatizing right. these beliefs. Well, that, that's what I said when I was on, on Pierce Morgan with this leftist guy. Yeah, we, did, we recently did. I a, know that. And, yeah. I, and it, that's when I said, you know, you've raped the word genocide. You know, yeah. By the way, I looked up, just for the record, my use of the word rape is appropriate. Every, uh, I think every dictionary I looked up had two definitions for rape, at least two. One is the obvious sexual violence, all right? Which is what rape is. I, I'm forcing someone to have sex, okay, or to to submit to my having sex would be even more accurate. Co- correct, but every other one, for example, because uh, a lot of dictionaries give examples, the rape of the rainforest. It is actually a very common... So wait, what's the second definition? That it is to despoil, oh. ruin, mm. degrade, a whole bunch of, of synonyms. Right. right. But nothing quite comes to, up to the level of, of the horror of rape. But that's what it is. And, and, and they gave one, gave, which is a common example, the, mm-hmm. the rape of, of the rainforest. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I say a word is raped, I, I, I've chosen a very severe word, but I right. have not cheapened the word rape. I may, if I'm wrong, I did cheapen it. But if I'm right, it, if if I'm a Nazi, haven't you raped the word Nazi of its meaning? Or what? Well, or you, you, obviously, you use a very a, a nicer word uh, to describe the. Uh, well, the, we've talked. We've talked. No, about- no, just now. Hmm. You use the word... Uh, cheapen? Yeah, cheapen, yeah. But cheapen and rape are obviously... Cheapen is not nearly as... as well, as... cheapen also doesn't capture the harm. Yeah, well, that's you know, right. Yes, to cheapen something right. is to yeah. dilute it, but, but yes. what really what they're doing by throwing around these terms so superfluously and so recklessly is they're doing a lot more than just cheapening it. They, yes, you know, which is... And I can't right. find is an effective right. word. I'm just noting it. Right. Because. And I've always... And I've said to Dennis and Julie listeners, because we have a very intelligent, sophisticated, mature, deep audience, t- tell a word... You know, throw out a word that you would have used. 
because that's right. That's I, I don't correct. know. I've told you. I don't know if I would have used that because I know that the argument would be yeah. well, you're but you're you're, you're, you're doing this, the word rape, right? Yeah. But but there we we need to find a word which captures the gravity. You know, something I've been thinking about. By the way, it's the great. Your English is beautiful. Really? Captures the gravity. You know, I have to credit my mom. My mom is a, is really eloquent. It, she and she growing up was not not in an annoying way, but she would always correct my grammar in a loving way my to make me better. My mother did that for me, yeah. by the way. So I I yeah. give all the credit to my mom, but I but also it's something I, I that give I give your mom eighty two percent of the credit. <laughs> well, it's something that you you have you to, get credit for wanting to do it. Well, you, there have been times when you've corrected me, for instance, with regard to, not in, in regards, regards to. Oh, in regards to. But you know what? Crazy. Here's the thing. Like, so there's a member of my family, an extended family member, who so whenever this person uh, makes a grammatical error, they, and I or my mom or someone will lovingly correct them. Uh-huh. They get upset. Right. And they view it as a criticism. Right. Obviously, if someone's going, you stupid, you know, POS, you, but that's not the nature in which my mom and I are correcting this person. You know, we're, we're trying to lovingly point it out to make them better. And this person always gets very kind of upset and takes it as a criticism. And I just can't understand that, that mindset. When someone corrects me, I'm thinking, thank you. You're ac- you're doing me yes. a service. You're preventing me That's from going out right. in the world and sounding like an idiot. And you're you're elevating me. And and as a my hu- Julie. Well, uh, well. It's so it's such a healthy correct response. I uh, hey, I just thought of an analogy. Yep. What if you had toilet paper hanging from you? What if yes. you Yes. Well, if you I was going to say a guy face? has his fly open. Yeah. So uh, if you go and whisper in his ear, I just wanted to let you know your fly is open. Are you angry at him? Of course not. Are you criticizing him? No. He's saving you from being embarrassed. If I am correcting your English, I'm saving you from... the. I've always viewed corrections as, thank you, that means I won't repeat it. Oh, I... Why isn't that a service? Well, telling someone the truth or correct... Now, obviously, if you're nitpicking and it's, you know... okay. okay. Again, we always have to add the caveats. I right, right, I affirm right. my okay. white privilege. Yes, here we go. I apologize. I atone for America. One, one minute. He's interjecting. Sean. Sean. No, no, no. I, it's much better than, especially if it's if it, it more than one sentence. Let people hear what you have to say. Oh, my God. He can do that? Yes. Welcome, Sean, to yeah, Dennis no, no, and no, Julie. No, no. We, we don't want to make a habit of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's now called Dennis, Julie, and Sean. Okay. Nah, nah, okay, go nah, ahead. Nah, okay. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, yep. I was just saying that you were talking about the war on truth and beauty and goodness, how the degradation of society was ushered in with the baby boomers, that grammar doesn't matter anymore, that uh, we're going to lose this. And I, I, I tend to agree with you that your generation may be the last, other than pariahs like Julie, who maintain eloquence. Uh, I think... One way of combating that is to be the way you are. Because you, you, I, I wait, know you, if you, you text me, you, you Dennis. Uh, I, talking... I, I have to elevate my, my texting response to you where I would otherwise uh-huh. shorthand something. So I think by being eloquent, by being elevated, you require that of others, or at least others feel obligated right. to meet um, you. I want to react that. to that. Okay. That's very good. All right. So you heard that, right? I'm so sorry. I didn't. Oh, that's the we poor should have listener left this. is going to have to. We should have led the speaker on. That's ironic. Wait, this, the the listener will hear it, and you won't hear it. Yeah. All right. So, in in a nutshell, uh, agreeing with all of what was said, but saying when I text back to you, Dennis, because of the way you text, I elevate my text one hundred percent. And my favorite book as many of you know, is Jane Eyre. And there is just, it's filled with nuggets of wisdom. And there's one uh, scene where Jane goes to work at a school for poor children, rural poor children. And she was talking about how, what a struggle it is to, to 
you know, rally these kids to want to pay attention to the lessons and to quiet down and et cetera. And there's, there's this great thing that Jane says, probably my favorite line in the entire book. And she said, you know, I, I, I treated them with dignity and I, and I treated them with uh, holding a high standard for their behavior. I almost treated them like an adult. And she said, when you treat people of, when you treat other people with dignity, they start to see themselves as more dignified. And that's going along with what you said. When you set a good example for someone, whether it's in a text message or just in an interpersonal reaction, you're, you, when you send a, an eloquent text to someone, you're indicating that you respect them. You're indicating that you want to impress them. You're indicating that you took time to, to be eloquent. And in turn, they start to see themselves as worthy of that time and that respect and being the recipient of your wanting to impress them. And then they will want to, in turn, impress you. It's amazing it, we're talking yes. about this with regard to texting. No, but no, you no. Get my no. Point. It, it doesn't matter what it is. This is, this is why I'm saddened by the number of... Christians who in the course of my career have called to disagree with me about dressing up for church. Mm. The way the way you dress like the way you text or the way you speak or the way you do anything influences the environment. The the human environment in which you're in. You text well, it says we're elevating the act of texting. Now, most people hearing that go, what the hell does that matter? But mm -hmm. they're wrong. Everything matters. Some things matter more than others. It's true. It's not on, this is not on the level of child abuse, text abuse. <laughs> but it's not on no level. Mm -hmm. and, and his point is very important. I elicited from him a desire to up his game by the way I presented myself, in this case through texting. By the, same, by the way, I regard the same thing with emails. I read all my emails. I don't send them. I, I try to catch any error, uh, uh, you know, missing a word, just like, just like I've written a book. But the dressing for church is, is really the one God doesn't care. So God, this is their argument. God doesn't care how you dress, which I, I don't believe at all. I think God does care. I 100, not 99, I 100% disagree with that comment. Uh, it, 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 if, uh, it, I have so much biblical context to show that God de deeply cares about how people dress, but I, I, I won't get into that right now. The, the, the elevating of the way you dress has an effect on everybody else. Absolutely. Well, what if someone showed up to your wedding wearing a crop top? Th that's right. Would you yes. Would you not be offended by that? Right. Or would you? I mean, yes. I, I, it's so. Funny. I, after all, they showed up at the wedding. Wh right. Wh what else you do I like, want? Come on, you're not you're not giving this day the proper respect that it deserves. It show it. It all goes back to it showing that the person didn't respect you enough to put in the time and to endow right. the that event with that a certain was, decorum. That, is, that was the thinking for generations until the 60s. That's why people dressed up to go to a baseball game. I, I owe it. Why did they do that? I owe it to others if I go in public to appear in a certain way. You know, you and I talk all the time about the way that certain ideologies have corrupted our society. And obviously that is true. I think a lot of our modern malaise has to do just as much with technology. Because, like, when you, when you didn't have social media and phones and, like, these things mattered more to you. Because you had to... I don't know if I'm making sense, but you had to pay more attention to the way that you lived your life, including the way that you dressed and the way that you interacted with people, because that's what that's what you had. That, that was the way that you impressed people. That was the way that you marketed yourself, if you will. But now that we have social media, people 
that's how they're spending their time and their energy. And you market yourself online with the pictures you post or the vacations you go on instead of who you really are as a person. I, I, I think technology is, has, has ruined a lot of this. I mean, with dating, yes, it's true that, you know, feminism has morphed from an, an ideology which was very focused with giving women equal rights. And now it's become this, I think, man-hating, masculinity-hating uh, way of thinking. But look at what I think. I think dating apps have really done the most harm to male female relationships as opposed to feminism because when you before dating apps you as a man the only way that you would get a girlfriend is if you walked up to a girl who you thought was cute in a restaurant or in church or wherever the heck and you talk to them and you ask them out now with with dating apps that's not the, swiping is the primary way of meeting people and so guys don't go do that anymore they don't they don't go up and talk to women they don't try to dress better to impress a woman D does that make sense T the the ideological I, capture it, it, it does make sense but it doesn't make sense it everything you said makes sense what doesn't make sense is wait a minute don't i want what whether it's on an app or in person don't i want to impress her i think that's the operative question but it doesn't seem to be operative in much of the single dating uh, apps. I, I don't. I don't understand that. Let's say if I were single, much younger, or even single my age, and I wanted, and I were on a, a dating app. Okay. Mm -hmm. The only question, the only one, would be how do I impress a woman? And sitting back and looking like that guy you mentioned, or. Uh, showing off my biceps, like like that's going to really do it for most women. Maybe an 18-year-old girl is going to really go, wow, what a hunk. Mo most women uh, do not date biceps. It, it just, I mean, men, uh, this is a word to men. It's great to have a good body. That's great. But that's not the most operative element for the vast majority of women over 18. Totally. Totally. Exactly. And I, See, they're so not in touch with male and female. They don't. A woman's body is ten times more important than a man's body in attracting the other sex. It's not fair, but it's a fact. By the way, I don't even. I don't even know if I would call that not fair. I just think that's kind of. Yeah, well, the that's, way, that's, that's uh, the way it is. And a man's personality yes. is 10 times more important than the woman's, and, per, and, you know. Initially, that's right. correct. That is absolutely right. It's just right. kind of the yes. way the world and, works. And certainly his income. Right. That's that's not fair to him. That's the Absolutely. way that's the way life works. So, but by the way, leftism is rooted in the de the denial of life. The, you you will like this. I never told this to you. Yes. Oh, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, I read and it kills me. Now I would know it because it'd be on the internet and and I would be able to look it up. Some woman writer wrote that leftism this is a really long time ago mm -hmm. she said it is rooted in the uh the uh denial that's it the denial of and then she wrote it in french les faits de la vie the facts of life there are many good reasons to buy gold and silver. Bank failures, digital currency volatility, emerging market countries trying to topple the dollar as a global reserve currency. Julie Hartman here for AmFed Coin and Bullion, Dennis's choice for precious metals. If you ask AmFed owner Nick Grovich to simplify the case for precious metals, he'll tell you that when President Roosevelt recalled the gold in circulation and paid people with paper money, they received a $20 bill for a $20 gold piece. Today, that $20 bill won't even fill half of your gas tank. But the gold piece is worth about $2,000. Which would you rather own? Now, let's simplify the reasons to use AmFed coin and bullion. Nick's been in the industry for over 42 years, and he's proud of providing transparency and fair pricing to build trusted relationships. If you're interested in buying or selling, call Nick and his team at AmFed coin and bullion, 1-800-221-7694, AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. That's what it is. 
it is it is a, the all that is why I say truth is not a left wing value. It's not meant to insult leftists. I know it's an insult, but it's not meant as an insult. If you deny facts of life, that means truth is not a but value. You're a value that, of that's course. exactly what it does. So if I say a leftist hearing, you know, uh, a uh, a man's body is not as important in attracting women as a woman's body is in attracting men. Sexist, misogynist, uh, old fashioned, oh, oh, right? In other words, they don't ask the question: Is it true? Is it discomforting? They ask. And this is my whole point: that the truth is good. When you get down to it, the truth isn't isn't. Uh, you know, favoring men over women or favoring one race over another race. The, the truth isn't bigoted or, or racist or sexist. The truth is good because, you know, some people may think it's so unfair that a woman's body matters more to men, you know, with, with the man than, than a man's body matters to a woman. But it kind of evens out because look at what I just said about income or look at what right, I just said about personality. Of course, it all does even I out. I mean, a man's... A, a, right. A man's, you know, what? a man is much a more very, defined by his career than a woman is. A very attractive woman I know. Oh, I could even say who it is. So my trainer is a very attractive woman, okay? We were together seven years. She's a mom, and married, and, and, and she's uh, and a great trainer, which is what matters to me most. But she's a good-looking woman, and we talk, we talk about this stuff. What am I going to talk about when I'm doing my 30th squat? Right? How much I want to get the hell out of here. So watching, I've seen Dennis work out once. Watching you do squats is so funny. Thank you. That's beautiful. So anyway, the uh, so he hates it. So we, much. Yes, that's correct. So well, who likes it? Give me a break. But anyway, uh, so she had a great line. She said, "I don't want to be with a man." who spends as much time in front of the mirror as I do. Totally. Isn't that a great line? Absolutely. By the way, I've seen uh, on, on Hinge, there's a lot of men like that. That's exactly right. Lift up the right. shirt. Yes, mirror, so I like, know. That's right. Come on. But, uh, oh gosh, what, what were we talking about? This was, this is a the denial. Tangent. The denial of facts. Yeah, but. Uh, mm. and the truth is not their value. You yes, are, but before truth. that, before that. Before that, we were Don't talking about. Don't you wish about, you could hit rewind? No, no, yes. We were talking about why Sean should probably not be heard when he has a comment to make. Oh, he found he found that funny, which is good. Um, <laughs> there was some point. Well, I'll, I'll I'll take it in a different direction. This is this yeah. is totally. A, it's a little off topic, but it's going back to. I thought of it when you were talking about how the World War II generation didn't give their children the same right. values that they enjoyed. Have you noticed that some of the worst? ideologies have come out of the West. Now, the West has been the most decent civilization to ever exist, but over the past two centuries, some terrible, terrible ideas have come out of the West. For instance, communism. Right. Marxism, Karl Marx was a German thinker. Nazism came out of Germany. Now, we we talked in a recent Dennis and Julie episode, you know, was is it fair to say that Nazism came out of the Christian world? I think it's the answer is yes. It is fair to say that. Now, Nazism wasn't a, a Christian ideology, obviously, but I, I hate saying this because there is such a war on the West right now that it seems like I'm, you know, tarnishing the West. I, I as I said, I believe it. It in the the evidence is in that it's been the most decent civilization. But but in the very recent past. Very malignant ideologies have ar- arisen in the ra- in the West. Wokeism right, has but arisen they're in the all, West. They're anti-Western ideologies. They are, but they're, they're the geography is the West. The culture is not West. Well, I, I may push back on that because you you are totally totally right that the ideologies themselves are anti-Western. However, the irony is, I think that they were born of Western freedoms and ways of thinking that that allowed such thinkers to emerge. For instance, one of the and, and this is when I'm 
introducing the subject, this is not to say that I am anti-freedom of speech or anti the values which have made the West, but ironically, freedom of speech is what has caused a lot of the issues that we're seeing now, because we, we live in a society where people can say whatever the heck they want, and it's given credence. Oh, this is a rare time where you and I differ. Well, uh, 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 only, only because if there were freedom of speech, they would be trounced. They, they, the only way the left can succeed in Canada, New Zealand, well, Australia. Well, look at the United States. We have freedom of speech States. in the United no, States. No, we and don't. They haven't been trounced. No, no, no. It has been trounced by the left. You open your mouth, you're fired. Well, it's starting you open to your get mouth, you, you, no, no, it's not starting. It, 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 right, but 50 years ago, that the, wasn't the case. You're right. There was freedom of speech 50 years ago. Right. So I'm saying if we really had freedom of speech, these toxic ideas of the left would get nowhere. They, they depend for their success on suppressing everybody else. If a teacher, I know a teacher, an elementary school teacher, and it was a he, which is very rare. It's only 20%, I think, of elementary school teachers are men. And he, he says, no one knows my beliefs. No one. I would be ostracized and, and perhaps even, even suspended if they, knew, if they knew my beliefs. No leftist worries about their beliefs being known. Not at a company, not at a, not at a college, not at an elementary school, nowhere. That we don't. We have less freedom of speech today in the United States than 200 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. So it's the pr- the crap that has come out is not a product of free speech. It's the product of suppression of free speech. I totally agree with you that over the past, in the recent you know history, in the past decade, there has been an assault on freedom of speech, which has favored the, you know the left at the expense of everybody else, 100% in agreement. However, these ideas that have been allowed to percolate in this country go back many decades. Woke, yes, wokeism is, is especially new, but the antecedents to wokeism, as okay. Paul Johnson outlines right. in, yeah. in modern times very well, go, goes they go back like a century. Years. That's right. And so what I'm saying is, and in no way am I anti-freedom of speech, but it's just interesting, the fa- like, the fact that we that we live in a society which get, allows everyone to speak has allowed these crazy ideas to emerge and that that's what's funny to me when i see when i see wokesters who are who are uh, anti freedom of speech who want to who want to punish hate speech for instance obviously they're hypocritical because they're they're not anti freedom of speech they're pro freedom of speech with themselves they're anti freedom of speech for the people who they don't like but but when they want to enact these laws uh, criminalizing hate speech i want to say the only reason that you can argue that hate speech should be criminalized is because you have the free speech to argue that hate speech right. could be so, criminalized. So again, I'm, I'm missing the point then. The point is that that a lot of our freedoms, the, the the openness of Western society, the fact that we've always allowed, you know, in the marketplace of ideas, you to say anything. You can get up and say the craziest idea that, you know, men and women are, that, that there are 38 genders instead of two genders. The Ironically, the thing that has made us great is now contributing to our demise. Because we have right, but uh, so again, all right. I understood that then, then from the beginning of what you said. I I don't blame freedom of speech. I understand. I understand. If freedom of speech were practiced, the left would be crushed. If people were not afraid of speaking out against the left, the the vast majority of Americans do not believe that there are thirty seven genders. Do not believe that men give birth. Do not believe that colorblind is racist. Do, I mean, I, the, the amount of inversions of reality uh, uh, that one is expected to shut up about at the least or mm-hmm. say yes to at best is, is equivalent to the number of leftist ideas there are. So they, they thrive on suppression of speech. There's a great quote from John Adams who says, when uh, during the, the founding, he said, this constitution, these freedoms that we are giving 
are made for a religious people. Mm -hmm. They are made for a reasonable people. people. Yes, a religious and moral people. And he says, you know, if if our constitute if our freedoms are not supplemented and supported by good moral values and reasonableness, our 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 system will cut through our culture the way a whale like breaks through a net like all hell will break loose in other words what he understood was that people should be allowed to have freedom of speech but you need to be responsible with that speech you need to temper and that's my point we have been reckless with our freedoms i would only modify i uh, your point is our our freedoms have enabled the toxic yes yes so that where where i uh, i would want to modify your statement and then agree with it is freedom generally the freest country in the world can only survive if you have dominant good values that that, that is precisely my point and, yes i know and, and, and i'm not just talking about freedom of speech i'm talking about That's freedom right. in the way that we dress okay, well you said freedom Fre- of speech yeah. you're right i did but yeah uh, but I, I so yeah that's correct you can free societies are dependent upon some basic universal or near universal affirmation of good values mm-hmm. or you're doomed because then the freedom and America's been the freest society ever is the anar- it becomes anarchy we ha- we are living in an anarchy right i i i i read on on my program uh, uh, well, the anarchy, first of all. I, well, I'll tell you what I read. I don't want to interrupt my own point. I read about four uh, illegal immigrants who beat up police in New York City. I saw that. They yeah. just beat them up. Yep. Uh, and, and the reason, as I pointed out, is there is an awareness today that you can do whatever you want. Yes. You can come into the United States if you want with no passport, uh, totally illegally, you'll be fine. You can beat up a policeman, and they were let out without bail. Mm-hmm. There, so there, the 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 left has has uh, is the product of freedom without values that yes. that keep freedom alive. That is my point. That is exactly my point. Because if you look at other countries where they don't allow, I'm going to use freedom of speech, but I, I I mean this point with freedom more generally, you know. There's a reason why wokeism doesn't exist in communist China or in Putin's Russia or in the Ayatollah's Iran or in the vast majority of countries in the world. And it's because they don't allow you to even get there. The second you start saying stuff that they deem to be unacceptable, they'll literally cut your head off. And that's not good. That is not good. We don't want to live in a society like that. But we have we have squandered our freedoms we have taken advantage of them because what we ought to do is uh, is have a free society that is tempered by values but what we've done is we've taken our liberal society lowercase i'm not talking about democrat so I lowercase now, l you have now and we've taken advantage me, of it you've enabled me to answer a puzzle that i have not had an answer to why are the most woke countries the English speaking ones. I have that this is the Canada, answer. Canada, New Zealand, Australia, United States. This is Britain, the answer. They're the freest. Yes. And that that's the the greatest irony to me is that is that right now we are using the the I, I wanna I wanna say this I wanna say this eloquently. We're using the tools which made us great to destroy to ourselves. destroy us. That's right. The, like that's the that's the funny thing where I look at these people who hate the United States and I'm like you could only exist in the United States. Like you are a product, you are a terrible product, but you are a product of the freedoms of the United States. The fact that you can, in, you know, say so here, and do whatever an you example. want. You yeah. would never be allowed to exist anywhere else. You stupid. You you would be laughed out of France even by the French left if you said men give birth in France. And France is a free country. It's just, but, but there are social norms. Our social norm was Judeo-Christian civilization. That was the social norm mm-hmm. of the English-speaking world. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's been 
trampled on by the left. So there is no more social norm. There right. is no such thing. Social norms are derided as dead white European male patriarchy, it, it's, it, heteronormativity, all these other terms that they use to dismiss the, the social norms. France has social norms that are not based as nearly as much on religion. They're, they're social, literally social norms, mm-hmm. societal norms. So that's why France has not succumbed nearly as much. The, the, we have relied basically on, in God we trust, it's one of the three models of the United States. It's right. not a motto of France. France um, uh, is a big believer in laicization. That's their term from French. Right. So they have relied on social norms, as has Denmark, as has Norway, as Norwegians aren't saying, uh, and that's as secular societies you can get. They're not saying men give birth. The, the idea is preposterous. Yep. They, uh, uh, none of them have hospitals like we do uh, g- giving uh, hormone blockers to 12-year-olds. They don't have that. It is almost unheard of in Finland. Mm-hmm. Well, this is this is the downside to freedom, and I am the most pro-freedom yes, chick you'll but it, find. But, but as, this is, as you it quoted, has be, it has to come with value. And this, it just, it is endlessly fascinating to me. Like, so I, I know I bring up Frederick Nietzsche a lot on this show, but he, he is. I honestly am just kind of obsessed with the way he wrote because it both so reviles me and both and also weirdly rings true. N- not everything he said, of course, but his whole argument is that, and he wrote in the 1800s, he said that mo- the modern uh, obsessions, and, and it's interesting, he even said it back then, this was 200 years ago, so it really shows you that the antecedents to wokeism have been, have been festering for some time. But he said that the modern malaise that we have now, obsession you know, with victimhood, uh, and and celebration of weakness. He says that it comes from Christianity. Dennis Prager here with a man I have come to admire for his work. So when I asked him, what do you do? This is the title he gave, Wealth Architect. Very simply put, I am a wealth architect that helps my clients accelerate the way they grow your wealth. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Internal Revenue Code is embedded with a number of things that you can take advantage of. It's what I call playing tax chess. We take the time to play tax chess in your favor. We give our clients unbiased, independent advice across all areas in their financial life because we have no incentive to sell anything. I was taken enough and impressed enough to have you do my work. And you have, in fact, saved me a serious amount of money. CharlesDombeck.com slash Prager. And he, he says that Christianity has enabled these kinds of ways of thinking by putting God on the cross. He says that's a celebration of weakness. What kind of, of God would so humiliate himself and put himself on a cross? This really, Nietzsche says this religion just... When they're putting their highest person on a cross, they are celebrating and giving credence to weakness, and they're encouraging weakness among the population. He said, you know, when Christianity says that people are are all equal, they're essentially supporting, like, radical egalitarianism. And sometimes people aren't equal, and sometimes people shouldn't be tr- treated equally. Obviously, I don't agree with everything that he he says. I think that Christianity is a beautiful doctrine, and I don't think it celebrates weakness. I don't think that it argues for radical equality. But I take his point that kind of what we're seeing right now are perversions— of Western ideas or or Western ideas that are taken too far. Like all these woke people who obsess about victimhood and obsess about weakness. What I want to say to them is like, it's ironic because they hate Christianity, but the only reason why they care so much about victimhood and care so much about weakness is that they have consumed a cultural diet in the United States over many centuries where we have cared about the underdog, where we have thought of people as equal. In the vast majority of countries, people don't people don't care about the underdog. People don't care about the minorities, you know? 
people just disregard them. The whole idea of the last will be first is a is a Christian idea, and it, that's a beautiful thing. And our and our attention to that for many many centuries made our society unique, but now people are using that and they're taking it too far. Does that make sense? That they're that they're they have bathed in this this culture where we have cared about the underdog. And it's because they've consumed that cultural diet that has contributed to their malignant well, they, outgrowths. They, what they did was they took the parts of Christianity that they like. I mean, it also says, Paul says, if, if, if you don't work, you, you don't eat. Any, anybody on the left quoting that? By the way, in general, uh, that, that's, the, that's the difficult an unanswerable, probably, issue with religion is what parts do you take and what parts do you reject? Uh, I'm more so talking how, about the, the culture that, that Christianity... I don't think that many of these indiv- individuals are smart enough nor informed enough to like read the Bible and take parts of what they want. I mean that yeah, Western I, uh, Christian what, society what it made. has contributed to this very liberal culture. And by liberal, I don't mean like Democrat Party. I mean liberal as right. It's endless, you know. And only and look, in a it re- also produced the end of slavery. Of course, Christians oh, produced I, that. I'm, no, I know you're not. No, I, the, the I'm point the is not whether you're knocking West. Christianity. That uh, that isn't the point. Your your point is, if you don't stop, you get to anarchy. Yes. Okay, that's and, correct. And only woke people could flourish in a. Christian, Western, right. free yes. society. And that's the irony to me because right. they hate the Christian free society. Here, but you, they you believe are the, the outcomes last will of be it. first. That's why we're having affirmative action for United Airlines pilots. Right. That's right. Blacks and women have been the last to be pilots. Now we're going to make them first. Woke people would never emerge in these dictatorial, repressive regimes because right. they or, would never have the freedom to have, emerge. Where you have other social cohesion, as I pointed out, like in France. Right. So it, it, it's, we may not survive our own suicide. We're just, it's so stupid. We're, we're so, we've gotten so dumb as a nation. People just don't realize how lucky we are to be in this system. Well, it's not easy to make a free society for a very long time. I know. Uh, that's, that's one of the lessons. That's why I've always said to my fellow Jews, you know, if you if you support the left here, you're crapping on the greatest place we've ever lived, we Jews. And you, you might want to remember that civilization is pretty damn fragile. Well, no, no one civilization has ever survived. I mean, civilizations all throughout history have yeah, risen but, and fallen. Well, I'll say this though: if that if that rule holds true for the West, the world will be engulfed. In, in a Holocaustian narrative. I know. I, I, tr- trust me, I know. I think about that a lot. You know, it's interesting because you and I have talked about what a sad and irrational phenomenon it is that there are increasing numbers of people who say, oh, I'm not going to have kids because of climate change or I'm not going to have kids because of whatever, systemic racism or so- something like that. It's like, come on. But I will say... As much as I criticize that, because I think the reasons are absurd, I, I, I want to have kids. I will have kids, God willing. Um, but I do worry. I, I, I have thought, you know, what will I be bringing my child into in the United States? Because throughout my lifetime, I anticipate that things are going to get a lot worse. And can you imagine throughout their lifetime? I mean, they'll live until the... Well, then into they, the 2100s. Then there, might be, then there li- literally might be a, 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 a bloody, not a bloodless, civil war. But you, you, the, We're optimistic on Dennis and Julie. Well, no, I said might be. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if, if what you said would happen. I'm not optimistic or pessimistic. I never think in those terms. I just ask, what do I have to do? But uh, I can only speak as a Jew. Jews had reason not to have children in every generation because things were so bad for them so often. Mm, true. And they had children. And 
that that's what you do and i i whether you're an optimist or a pessimist all i want to know is are you going to have children <laughs> because if you're an optimist and and you don't have children your optimism is useless and if you're pessimistic and you have children then good i salute you you're pessimistic but you know what you have to do and as bleak as things are now and it, and it really is just insane what is going on the fact that we have I think the the greatest example is the Department of Justice is suing the state of Tennessee because Tennessee recently passed laws which say that you cannot get genital mutilation surgeries until you are 18. And the Department of Justice, what an Orwellian name, is suing the state of Tennessee saying that they are discriminating against LGBTQ children. Uh-huh. I mean that that is, I mean I could give many many more examples of just how bad things have gotten. And you and I both know how bleak it is. However, I often do think about, I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like to live during the Civil War or leading up to or after the Civil War? I mean, talk talk about a moment when you thought that things would, would be done forever. I mean, yeah. there have been times in this country where people people have had this this thought and it was arguably in a worse situation than we're in now. Well, I think this is worse. I yeah, thought I about that too. a lot because there was one huge difference, and huge is an understatement: slavery, or even the the alleged inferiority of blacks. But the uh, otherwise, there was a lot that united the North and the South love of country, of the, the founders. I mean, the, 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 we have nothing in common in the United States today, left mm. and right, nothing. People who say we have more, oh, this, I hear this from politicians and some writers, oh, we have so much more in common than we have that divides us. Not anymore. Well, we don't. It's just, right. uh, it's ridiculous. Well, if, if you say... If, if you want kids to attend drag queen story hours, what do I have in common with you? Well, really, literally, what do I have in common? That you don't regard bringing a kid to a drag queen show as not good for that child, having nothing to do with L or G or B or T or Q or I or A, just or plus. not good? Right, or plus. I, I totally hear you, however... Hindsight is twenty twenty, and we know the way that the Civil War worked out, and how we were able to recover from that. Can can you really imagine if you were in you know eighteen sixty and and states were seceding from the Union and and there was a full blown war and it was over this moral atrocity? I mean, when you were in it, you probably thought there's no there's no way we're ever going to get through this. This is yeah, this is as did, bad as it they gets, did right? In but a few we know years. they did. Yeah, that you're right. At any given moment, and so it's moment, easy for us to go. Well, it's worse now than it was no, then. No, it, it, it's not easy because I think a lot of people would say, "What are you kidding? The number of Americans who were killed in, in the Civil War, and you're you're saying it's worse today? I don't know if it's easy. I just know it's far longer. That it is it is getting worse. Well, what what really scares me... And by the way, just the opening of the border to millions and millions of people to come into the country who who don't share our values. Right. uh, We didn't have that during the Civil War. I mean, it's... The assault on America is is ubiquitous. Well, what, what particularly scares me about this moment is the irrationality... And the denial of reality. And look, obviously, the most irrational and denial of reality thing that you can ever think is that black people are inferior to white people. I mean, that, you know, you one could argue that during the Civil War, that was the that was the epitome of of the adjectives or descriptions that I just used. But now, like. It is really scary that we have people who like like swaths of people who literally like don't believe in reality, who think that there are 38 genders, who think that Israel is committing genocide, who, you know, like think that that 
there are, that conservatives are white supremacists. I mean, these are like convictions of just a distortion of reality that and people have. And it's a have. lot of convictions. And it's a lot. Yes, it's not just one. And obviously that that one slate was was the most egregious, immoral, you know, abominable one that one, that a person could have. But now it's like it's it's so it's like police you can live in a society where there are no police. You can have mental health professionals. You can give puberty blockers to minors. You you like it's so do you do you understand what I'm saying where it's like it's it's it's, it's like a mental illness. Right. It All is I could such say a is denial very, of reality. Very few people of your generation uh, have the have the understanding of the inversion of reality they're expected to accept. I would be curious for your college roommates to hear what you just said and say, oh, yeah, of course Julie makes sense. I don't, I don't think most would. you agree? I do. Mm-hmm. And, Maybe and not singling out the, those people, but the greater, yeah. the greater class, I, I do agree. And now is habit. <laughs> As we know. What's our story, Mr. Sean? We're done. Boy, it flies by. Thank God. I know. I've never felt on this show like we're... Boy, we, is time dragging. Yeah. I've never <laughs> felt... I've only felt disappointed when it ends. That's Have nice. you ever felt that on, on the air? Like, I gotta, uh, num- I gotta number, get through this? Number 39. No, I'm just kidding. I don't mean on this show. I mean just in your career. No. Uh, that's a terrible oh, feeling. Oh, that's a bad sign. I will tell you this. It's it, it's a light note, but it's a very serious one. I began speaking publicly at 21. And if, within a few years, I was giving a speech. And in the middle of the speech, I said to me, I vividly recall it, Dennis, you're boring me. Ooh. And... That was the last time I ever, and I've given thousands of speeches, that is the last time I ever thought, am I boring? I am relentlessly interested in being interesting. Part of the reason is I bore me so we, I, I get bored so easily. You do. That, that is a gift. It turned out I would have been diagnosed with ADD. I would have. There's no doubt in my mind. It turns out if I have it, I don't know. But if I do, it's a gift because it has helped make me and my writing, not just my speaking, interesting because I get bored so easily, including of my own writing or my own speaking. It's a great test. I do this before I do an episode. Would I want to watch this? Would I want to listen to this? Would I be riveted by this? Yes. Yeah. You can reach me at julie at julie-hartman.com. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. I'm so good at this spiel. I've stopped asking you to, to cut in. Because you I'm do so, so well, yes, exactly. Yes, because I'm so, I'm so good at it. Do you know your Instagram handle? Certainly do. Would you like to? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> at the Dennis Prager and Twitter is Dennis Prager. That's so easy. But you know what? You know what I love about you? You don't, like, your mind is so oriented to the big stuff that even if every single week I'm reminding you of what your handles are, you will never remember it because you just right. so, it's not, yes, it's not significant. It's not a good thing, but yes, you're right. I'm preoccupied with the big stuff. By That's the way, true. someone wrote in to me saying that yeah. my shalom is offensive to Jews. It wasn't a Jew, I'll bet. I think it was. Really? Yeah, this person was like, it's making fun of Judaism. See, we live in a sick age. How is saying that? No, I know. It's, it's, I, I know. It's with admiration. It's no, no, fun. And then, uh, I mean, what if you said to to people, if if I were Japanese, okay, your co-host was Japanese, you go sayonara or sayonara, as they say, uh, in, in front of a Japanese got person, or arigato, which is Japanese for thank you. Uh, Sometimes the right can be just as cancel culture as oh, the Oh, that's interesting. You think that person was on the right? Yeah. Because they said, love Dennis and Julie, you know. Yeah, it's sad. 
I I would love that person. I that's why I love talk radio. I would love to dialogue this through with that person. It, it, it's a pure endearment. Of course, I it's a it's just a I like it. audibly. It's it's just a fun word to say. Fine. Shalom. Yes. On that note, shalom. Not gonna stop. <laughs>